Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem of the newly formed Ududua Nation. to Heritage Television in London. I want to thank you for being very patient with me today. It's been a lovely time that I am going to be taking on one of our most important personality of the year in 2021. One of our fathers in Odudua land. No matter what you feel, no matter what you think, you will know how hard this young man has been working. I call him young man. He could be my father. But I call him young man because he is so energetic. And when someone is energetic, you have to admit that. That this young man is very energetic. Uh, and he's not someone that wants to blow his trumpet. He doesn't do things to please people, but he wants to do things to please his own art. And what do I mean by that? He will do things in the background, and we say some few things that he thinks you might want to know. But not necessarily everything that he's been doing has actually been exposed to everybody. So for that reason, some people love him, some people hate him. But it doesn't matter. It depends on what God, how his own personal relationship with God. And as long as he preaches his conscience, that is the most important thing. Tonight, I have a big pleasure, big, big, massive pleasure in speaking to FFK. I'm sure you can actually guess that who that person is he has a very big pen that he write with every time there's no day that goes by or no week that goes back by without you actually seeing this man's writing on the wall and he doesn't write under the desk he writes in the sky so that everybody can see his writing it's a big pleasure to welcome mr femi fanny Cowdy onto my platform Good, e good afternoon, sir. Good evening, sir. Good morning, sir. I know you are evening now, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Great, Great to be here. here. <laughs> I hope I hope the way I have actually introduced you will spell some few things for some few people today. Because, obviously, we need to know who come on, Femi Fanikaude is. Yeah, just, just come in one more The thing is coming off his ear. I'm sorry. sorry. That is That's it. Fault. Got, Got it, it now. Fault. That is my fault. I'm okay, I'm okay now. now. It's not. It's one of my guy that's actually gone there to to set this one up, and he hasn't set it up okay, properly, okay. properly. Properly. So, before we start, who is Femi Fanny Coyote, sir? Well, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm a young, young man, man of 61, 61 years, years old this, this year. year. Uh, uh, the end of this year, I'll be 61. 61. That's, that's a, a very, very young, young man. man. Um, 
I'm a Nigerian, Nigerian born in, in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, Nigeria, October 16, 1960. Uh, I was born uh, into the South of the Power. My father became deputy, deputy premier of the Western, Western region. region a couple, couple of years after, after I was born. And, uh, and uh, therefore, I was raised, raised in Ibadan. I lived, lived in government house in Ibadan. In Ibadan. It was in 1966 was when the first coup took place. After, After which, which um, we, we moved, moved out, out of the country, country during the course of the Civil, Civil War. Um, um, I never, I never went, went to school in Nigeria. In the age, in the age of, seven of seven or eight, eight I, I went to school, school in the United, United Kingdom. Kingdom. And I went, I went to, uh, to my uh, Homewood House, my Homewood, which was my, my prep school. school. And then Harrow School, Harrow in London, which in my view is the best school in the United Kingdom. 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 Better than, better than even by, by far. far. Then, by, then, by, then, then after, after that, that, I went I to Kelly College in the West Country, to, uh, in Devon. Uh, in De Breaking. Okay, Fantastic. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you, sir. Okay. I can hear you, sir. Okay, so I'll go on. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so after that, uh, I now went to um, the University, University of London, my first, first degree. degree. And then I went to the University of Cambridge, Edinburgh College for my second degree. Uh, Cambridge is the university that my grandfather and my father had attended before. And my great grandfather was at Durham University many, many years before then. So the pleasure for me to tell you that even my children have been through most of these universities now. But um, for me, anyway, after university, I went to uh, back to Nigeria to do the Nigerian bar, practiced in my father's firm for a number of years, became a full partner, and then I went into politics in 1990. Long thing, you know, many things to say about politics. If we talk about what I've done for that, from 1990 to now, we'll, we'll spend all our time on that. But I was very, very active and uh, from a very young age. And uh, let me skip a lot of things, but I went to the Bible Seminary uh, in 1993, which was very important. For me, that was the most important institution of learning I ever attended. I went through pastoral training for two years and I got a degree. After which uh, I came back to Nigeria. I joined in ADECO and the fight against General Fanny Abacha and against military rule. And, and from, from that, that point, point, I felt there was no point in us being together, together as a nation, given what our people, the Southwestern people, the Anagos of the Southwest, the sons and the daughters of Dudua, suffered so much at that period when our people were being killed and these were driven into exile and, uh, and we were humiliated by a very vicious military government. Um, so I relocated to Ghana. From 1997, 1997, this is after I did the Bible, Bible College, College. I, went, I came back to Nigeria and then went back to Ghana again in 1996-97, where I was the second in command of Nadeko in Ghana under the leadership of Chief Tundedu, the late Chief Tundedu, who was our commander at the time. And we were working actively at that time for the dismemberment and the breakup of Nigeria. We were bringing arms into Nigeria at that time. Because at that time, the, the maximum dictator was planning to perpetuate himself in power, and we were not prepared to accept that. Hmm. What then happened was that General Abacha was murdered. Because the, the, the Americans knew that if he did that, there would be a civil war in Nigeria if he succeeded himself. Hmm. So General Abacha was murdered. And sadly, uh, in, in order, order to balance, balance the equation, as they, they said, our leader, leader and the person whom we believed in who was our true leader and the Democratic, Democratic president of Nigeria at that time, the son of the Southwest by the name of Chief M. Kabiola, was, was also murdered. murdered. They, they said, said to, to balance the equation. And uh, and that is, uh, you know, the history, you know, the rest is history. It, uh, the Southwest would have exploded, but for the fact they brought another son of the Southwest from prison, who they had jailed unfairly, fairly. General Abbasonjo, and that, that was the only way to save Nigeria, Nigeria at the time and keep us united. They brought him in, they made him president, even though the Southwest were not really interested in his candidacy, 
they wanted, wanted someone else. else. But Abuja came, came and he won, won the election, election. and, and he, he became president. president. It's at, at that point, point that I just started thinking about it. Well, my role was that I didn't want to come back to Nigeria. But Chief Bolaige ordered me to come back in 2001. And then at that, after that, I had the privilege of meeting um, President uh, Obasanjo in And we had a very long discussion, an eight hour discussion. discussion. And uh, it's at that point that um, I decided to start getting close to him. And he, he was kind enough to draw me very close to him. And I spent virtually every weekend from that year onwards. Um, at, uh, you know, in his in, at the villa, uh, spending the weekend with him, I'd go and, and spend the whole weekend, weekend with Akio Chukwu, and uh, would stay with that time. Fantastic, fantastic! It's, it's a great thing. So, two thousand and three, I joined. You know, he, we did the election, and uh, and he appointed me in his government as as a spokesman. Uh, and then after that, I became a minister. Not too long after that, first the Ministry of uh, Culture and Tourism, then as Aviation. Um, and after that, um, he left office. We left in 2007. And uh, then since then, since that time, I've been very still active in politics, uh, very much involved in the PDP, uh, um, had issues with the Aradwaz government, uh, and even Jonathan's government at some point. But, but I've been involved deeply throughout since that time. And in 2015, I led President Jonathan's campaign um, uh, against General Buhari. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we lost the election, or rather we were rigged out, and then President Buhari became president. And I've been in opposition since that time for the last five years. Uh, and it's an honor and a privilege to have been able to do that, to speak truth to power. Uh, and I still do that. I've come to the realization now, however, that we need to be extremely careful in this country because I believe we're on the brink of a civil war. Uh, and I've been very active in trying to build bridges to ensure that even if we're going our separate ways, if that is the desire of the people of Nigeria, so be it, but we must do it peacefully. And if we choose to stay together as a nation, then we must be at peace with one another. And that really is the struggle today, to ensure that whatever it is, we do not have war in our country. So in a nutshell, that's 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 FFK, and that's what I've been up to. And by the way, I'm a chief. I'm not a mister. I'm the Sadaki Shinkafi. I'm the Otumba of Jogaland. And I have about four other chiefs and titles. Uh, but really, you just call me FFK, and I'm very comfortable with that. I have a... I have a uh, is it nine now? No, it's more than nine. It's about 11 children. And, uh, and I have a wife who lives in Ghana. Uh, I have an ex-wife who lives in Nigeria. <laughs> and I could go on and on and on. So that's me. That's FFK. I've been through many storms in my life, but I love, I love who I am, what I am. I love where I come from. And I love being a son of Ududwa. And I love every inch of this country, Nigeria. And I love being a Yoruba man. I love being an Anago. I love being a son of Ududwa. And I'm very proud of that. Fantastic. Uh, I'm sorry to say, Mister, initially, but I, 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 I. No, it's not a problem at all. I have no, I have no problem with that. I'm just joking. You can call me FFK if you like. You can even call me Femi. It doesn't matter to me. But sometimes, you know, when we do these programs, they say you say you're Mister. When you leave the air, when you talk to your people, where you've given a title, where you were given title, they'll say, "But why are you dishonoring us like this? We gave you a title. You're not." Uh, say, but I'm very proud of, of my titles, and I'm very, I'm honored to have a title as Saudaki Chinkafi, particularly which is a, a, you know, a key leader in uh, one of the biggest emirates in Zamfara State, wonderful people. And I'm also a Tumba of Jogaland. Uh, and, and like I said, I have two titles in the East and about three others in the South. And I have a, quite a number coming. And I'm a lawyer by profession, by the way. I forgot to say that. So that's just okay. it. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I, you brought and, oh, by the way, I'm also facing a lot of criminal prosecutions. For seven years, I was prosecuted by previous governments and I was acquitted and discharged. And then uh, another, for the last five years, I've been prosecuted again by this present government. And by God's grace, I'll be acquitted and discharged because on all these matters, I did absolutely nothing wrong. They're all politically motivated. I haven't left this country for the last 13 years. My passports were seized by the Yaradra administration, by the Jonathan administration, and by the Buhari administration. And I couldn't give a damn one way or the other. I'm very happy. Uh, I live within my own world. I make my impact. Recently, I was voted as the most um, consistent and the most powerful opposition voice in this country. Uh, there were of the top 10, I, I was the number one. Uh, the PDP as a party came num was number five, but I was number, I'm very proud of that. Um, but right now, what I'm trying to do is use 
my good offices to build bridges because we really are on the brink of civil war. Finally, I had about five columns in Nigerian newspapers and websites. They've all been closed down. They threatened the publishers. They threatened the, 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 the editors and said that my writings are too strong. So they closed them all down one after the other. But thank God for social media and thank God for the courage of particularly the websites. I have about 13 that continue to carry my essays and things. Anytime I write on Facebook or I write on these blogs, I get at least one million uh, people reading my stuff within three days throughout the country and uh, throughout the world. Within, within within seven days, I have about eight to nine million people. So I'm fine if they lock me out of the newspapers. At one point, I was banned uh, from being on air on television in Nigeria by this government. Uh, and um, although I do go from time to time, um, the NBC warned everybody that this guy can set the country on fire simply because they didn't want to hear the truth. But, but what I'm saying is that what we're trying to do now, because we're in a conflict now, yeah. is we, we you know I've, I've tried to be a little bit more relaxed on that and try to build bridges so that we can come together we must have a country before we can talk about which direction we're going and i'm bridge building now i'm working closely with people from all, all over the country to ensure that whatever decisions we make in the future we do them in a peaceful uh, way in which people are not butchered and killed okay thank you very much for a very comprehensive of who ffk <laughs> is uh I hope I didn't say too much. <laughs> I, I have a pen. Look, look at me. And I have a pen and a paper. Right. right. Things while you were saying all these things today. One of the things I want to bring out is that you said you're a politician and you're a pastor. That makes it very difficult for you, for people to understand sure. you because that is why a lot of people doesn't understand you. Yeah, I, I, I went through pastoral tr um, training yes. uh, for two years from 1993 at a very critical time in my life. I was very ill in 1993, and it's part of my testimony. And I'd been to every hospital, every place in, Ga in Nigeria for prayers, every hospital, nothing worked. And uh, it was when I went to Ghana, the Action Faith Ministries in Ghana, uh, under the leadership of Archbishop Peter Duncan Williams, the father of the Pentecostal Church in Ghana. Uh, I learned at his feet, and at the feet of Reverend Abu Bakr Baku, who was the principal of the Bible College that I went, who is a Nigerian, and uh, I went through pastoral training, very rigorous. Every day for two years, I was always in the church or in the Bible school, and we learned everything about the body of Christ and about the word of the living God at that time. And it transformed my life. But my calling wasn't in, in, in pastoral, you know, ministry. I just went through the training, and I got the degree, and I, you know, went through that successfully. But every aspect of my life was impacted after that, and I carry my faith into everything that I do. And that's my strength. That's my joy. And that's why I have faith. That's why I have courage. That's why I fear no man born of woman. And I don't fear any man untimely ripped from his mother's womb either. Uh, I fear nothing. I only fear God. And it is because of my faith in God, because my testimony is strong over and over and over again. The Lord has, you know, proved his power and his might in my life and in my circumstances, which is why I've never even for one minute thought of running away from Nigeria, even when I was facing, faced the most fearful per uh, persecution being locked up for three months by this government, even in Boko Haram cells with Boko Haram terrorists and prisoners all around me, uh, God gave me favor even before these people. And some of them are my friends up till today. So, you know, I've seen a lot. I've been in the lion's den. Uh, I've suffered a lot, but I thank God for who and what I am. And I'm very proud of the fact that my God is mighty, a true shield, the lifter of my head, the author and finisher of my faith, my shield and my glory. So he's my strength. He's my everything. Wow, wow, wow. You, you, you're bringing out more points and more points as we go. A lot of people, you recently went to, on a meeting in uh, Abuja, Kogi State House? To no, no, I, I have not been to Kogi State House. I live in, I live in Abuja. Yeah. I've lived in Abuja since 2003, uh, since 2002. Um, but if you're referring to my meeting with the governor of Kogi State, it was here in Abuja. It was not in, uh, in Kogi State. But so that's it. Yeah. That, that one. How, how did that meeting happen? Because a lot of people want to know how were you invited or did you go there on your own accord? No. What, what, you it depends which you meeting you refer. No, no. It depends which meeting you're referring to. I, I, I got to know the governor of um, uh, of um, Kogi State. Uh, yes, recently. Good friend of mine. Good, good man and a profoundly good man and a very courageous man. I tend to be attracted to strong men. And uh, strong men tend to be attracted to me. So you have people like Namdi Kanu, people like um, like um, uh, uh, Asari Dokobo, uh, people like uh, Sunday Igbohu, Gani Adams. These are the people that I I I, I tend to 
uh, be attracted to. And the governor of uh, Kogi is a very strong, strong man, and he's a he's a, he's a profoundly good man. It was through Senator Smart Adeyemi, who's who has been my friend for over thirty years. We met, we interacted, we discussed issues about working across party lines and so many things. And we had a lot of meetings with uh, the governor of the APC, the governor of uh, Yobe State, national chairman of APC, all about how we can all work together, even though on different sides of the political divide, to, to bring cohesion to our country and to move our country forward, even though I'm on the other side, I'm in PDP there in APC. So that's how it all started. Um, so we met quite severally, you know, and had a few meetings. But if, if it's what I think you're referring to, the meeting you're talking about, when we came together to try to solve a very complicated problem where our country was literally on the brink of war, and I was called upon to join to try to assist um, the governor who had been given a task by President Muhammadu Buhari to solve the problem within 72 hours. And what problem was that? It was the issue of the food embargo on the South. And uh, we needed to come together to ensure that the embargo was, was terminated and that we could end it in a reasonable way that everybody would go home quite happy. It was a very difficult task. Uh, and I had the honor and privilege of being invited by the governor of Kogi State, uh, Governor Yaya Bello, to come and participate in that. And uh, I got the call in the middle of the night. I went there and immediately discussions started, negotiations started. And uh, I met a number of people. And um, the reason why they asked me to come was because they wanted me to reach my good friend and brother, uh, uh, Sunday Igbohu, um, um, Chief uh, Sunday um, Adeyemo uh, in Ibadan. We're very close, uh, remarkable, uh, a very strong man, a good man, and probably the most powerful man in the Southwest today. Uh, and, and so I, I, I have a lot of um, respect for him. He has a lot of respect for me. We met in Ibadan recently. And um, so they felt that I could speak to him uh, to agree to uh, participate in this because the greatest challenge the Northerners had about terminating the strike, the, their main reason for not wanting to do, terminate the strike was because they felt that their people would be unsafe in the Southwest. As long as Sunday Igbo would not give a guarantee of uh, peace and they would not say that um, their people could come there and live in peace, they were not going to come. That was their first condition. And so it was on that basis that uh, Yaya Bello reached the president and said FFA had to be involved in this because he can reach Igbo. And, um, you know, it was an honor for me to be involved. And I was asked, and I called Sunday, a good man, there and then, and he pledged that his target, the target of the people of the Southwest, were not uh, the ordinary um, Hausa Fulani people, peace-loving people, who were not killing anybody or committing atrocities against our people in the Southwest, that our, we target and we fight and we resist and we oppose the, the, the Fulanis who are mainly foreign Fulanis, who the killers, the murderers, the mass murderers, the ethnic cleansers and the genocidal maniacs who live in our forests in the Southwest, who take over our forests, uh, kill our people, rape our women, destroy our property and uh, kidnap us and treat us as if we're animals in our father's land. Those are the people he was opposed to. Those are the people I'm opposed to and not the ordinary House of Fulani people. And he made that clear and he gave a guarantee that if you come in peace to the Southwest, you have nothing to fear. That was the beginning of the negotiation. Once he said that, and uh, Yaya Belu conducted the whole thing very well, it was at that point that we could see the door of peace and the Northerners sat down as well and said what they had to say. And the rest is history. We spent the next two, three days, you know, having discussions in the middle of the night. And I must commend the skill and the ability of Governor Yaya Bello. By the way, the other side, that is the Northern group, uh, comprising of the unions and then a group called the Northern Consensus, Consensus uh, uh, Movement, led by a brilliant man by the name of Dr. Uh, Abdullah, I believe his name is, Awal Abdullah, I believe his name is, a uh, brilliant man, and a number of others, um, all said, clear, loudly and clearly, they would not negotiate with anybody, they would not sit with anybody from the government side, unless it was Yaya Bello, because they trusted him and they knew he was close to the president. So, Bello and the government brokered this, and uh, we had a very successful three, four days. Uh, uh, all the unions were there, amalgamated union representing about 80 separate unions, and, and and they had chairmen from all the various states. Every state in the federation was represented there. And the food embargo held, and it was it was affecting prices in the south. You would buy, you know, a goat that would cost one fifty thousand, you know, one day after three four days was costing one million naira in some parts of the uh, of southwest. And um, and then you know, food prices went rocketing up. And the reason they did all this because I think it's important for us to understand the context in which this is happening. This happened since we're talking about this now was they complained that 
during the NSARS crisis, over 100 of their people were killed. Um, the government did nothing. The government did not arrest anybody. Nobody was locked up. Then they said they didn't do anything in retaliation. Then they said that during the Shasha uh, uh, killings, crisis. the Shasha crisis in battle, they had about 250 of their uh, people, innocent people, slaughtered in the streets. Uh, which is true because I was in Ibadan at the time, and I and I, you know, I saw what happened. They were massacred, and um, although Yorubas too were killed, but there were about two hundred and fifty of their people killed. They they had the names of everybody that was killed. Very well organized people. They had the names. They had the statistics. Everything, and they said, given the fact that this has happened, they don't feel safe in the southwest anymore. Their people were leaving in droves. They were ordered to leave. And um, once they had started leaving, they're not going to let them come back. And that's why the food embargo came in to try to uh, show that, look, they're not prepared to accept this and they're not going to cope. They had, they actually had task forces stopping people from bringing food down. They policed it themselves. It was a very, very effective embargo. But let me tell you something that you may not know, which um, a lot of people, they just don't know what God just delivered us from. Um, because the real issue wasn't even the food embargo. Uh, the real issue was the fact that, I can tell you this, that the North, um, the militant wing of the North, were literally fully mobilized to conduct retaliatory killings against Southerners all over the North because of what they believe they've been subjected to in Yoruba land and because they felt the government did not do anything about it. So they were fully mobilized. And we, we saw evidence of this. I saw evidence of it. Uh, some of the people that were involved in that actually joined us to meet with us. After Sunday, Igbo agreed. Did, did they carry AK-47 to that meeting of yours that day? No, they, they cannot carry AK-47s to a meeting which I will sit. We spoke, we, we sat together as gentlemen. And, uh, you know, it's a very serious issue, this, that we're discussing. You can't carry AK-47 to such a meeting. Well, we sat down as we... AK-47 to their meeting in the north, sir? No, no, no. That's, this is not this sort of meeting. This is a meeting okay. of gentlemen of civilized people mm. it's not a meeting of people carrying guns and a meeting of people that certainly control those that carry guns and the government brokered it it wasn't a, a meeting of warlords the government brokered the whole thing in order to achieve peace and what i was trying to say was that they were fully mobilized and well organized and believe me they had everything in place and they didn't give a damn and their position was that i won't mention the name of the the leader because he's no, somebody no, that no, i've got to know but he and 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 he came there and and um they acknowledged the fact that the government would resist them but they were prepared to die to the last man to avenge the killings of their people in the south and it was really as simple as that and 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 they said that the only thing that can stop them from doing that is if there is a guarantee that people are no longer going to be killed if the food embargo um um the food embargo issue is settled and then they can now think of calling off what, to all intents and purposes, would have been a massive program. I made the point that if that happened, of course, there would be retaliation in the South, and that would have been the end of Nigeria. I mean, it's as simple as that. They went as far as to tell us that, do I realize, and this was said openly, I, this is what was not said just behind closed doors. It had been said behind closed doors before, and it was said during the meeting that we had, which television cameras were there. If you go and check, um, uh, the speech by the president of the uh, Northern Consensus Movement. He said it. He said, look, he said, uh, their people are being killed in the southwest. He said, if you look at the situation in the north, that in Kaduna and in Kanu alone, there are more Yoruba people in Kaduna and Kanu than there are in the, that there are Hausa Fulani's in the whole of the southwest. And the difference is that the, 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 the people, the, the Yorubas in Kaduna and Kanu own land. They're professionals. They have big businesses. They're doing very well. They're flourishing. They have massive investments. Some have been there for generations. He said, but if you look at the house of Fulanis in the, in the, in the Southwest, the majority of them, you know, uh, suya sellers, cobblers, uh, uh, people that uh, cut people's toenails and things like that. They're security men, Okada riders. And uh, therefore, you know, at the end of the day, if you target them and they target our people, who's going to lose? that, you know, we have far more to lose, which was a very strong point. And therefore, it was important for us all to understand the futility of violence and killing one another. And that is why they came up with a suggestion that, look, instead of attacking uh, uh, northern, uh, so uh, Southerners in the North, they will do this food embargo. They have a lot of demands. They want security for their people in the South. They want to ensure that uh, multiple taxations along the, the federal roads are, not, are, not, are no longer imposed on them. 
They want to ensure that there's compensation for the people, their people that were killed in the South. They were, um, you know, monetary compensation and for the property they lost and a number of other demands. And each demand we went through one after the other. But the key to it all, the person that unlocked the process for this and ensured that it was successful, the credit has to go to Sunday Igbohu, who did a lot to ensure that this process could begin. And then you have to go to Ayabelo, who managed it in a very skillful way and ensured that the federal government considered all the terms in a favorable manner. And that's why after we finished, long and short of it, we went to the presidential villa to present the report together with the union leaders to the chief of staff of the villa, who was overjoyed and a wonderful man. Uh, and, uh, and um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Professor Gambari, a wonderful man. And he, he, he took the report and uh, we had a meeting with him. Uh, we had a press conference at the villa as well. And then after that, um, the following day, the matter was taken to the president directly by the person who convened the meeting, that's Governor Yaya Bello. So that, that, that is, in, in essence, is what happened at that time. Nigeria was pulled back from the brink. And a lot of people are very jealous of the fact that Yaya Bello pulled this off. But he pulled it off and the credit has to go to him. And for that, uh, I'll be eternally grateful. And every person that was involved, the unions, Igboho, the people. And by the way, we spoke to the governor of um, or your state as well. Uh, during the course of the meeting, we called him and he endorsed our position. He also lent his voice and uh, we told him what we had discussed with Igbo. And also two other governors of the Southwest were reached. I made sure that I sent a message to two other governors, Governor Akiri Dolu and, um, and uh, Governor Fayemi. I sent a good friend of mine, Idowu Ajanoku, to him so that they, they, they were also fully aware of what was going on. But what, what we had in that situation was that at the end of the day, everybody pulled back from the brink. You know, I have to say this, that... Um, a gentleman by the name of um, of Sheriff, uh, who is the organizing secretary of the Northern Elders Forum, a good man, a strong man, a very, very strong man, uh, who is very passionate about the safety of his people. We disagree on a lot of issues, but he played a key role as well. If you mention Igbo, you have to mention him because he also made a lot of concessions and he ensured that the idea of butchering Southerners in the North, that it didn't come to pass. And we have to thank him for that. And everybody there played a key role. People like um, Asaki Yaki Buhari and a number of others. And, you know, it was a great time and we pulled back from the brink. And this showed me that whatever our differences can be, uh, we, can, we can work things out at the table. And uh, complex problems can be solved simply by talking and honoring your word. And I saw that in operation. I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we achieved that. Okay. Can I ask you one quick question, sir? In that meeting... How many Yoruba, how many Southerners were in that meeting? Were you the only Southerner in it's that not meeting? A question, it wasn't a question of um, um, representation in that way. I've told you there were only about four or five people at the initial discussion we had. Yeah. If you remember, I told you that it was only one person representing the federal government of Nigeria, and that was Yaya Bellu. That was the initial meeting that we had, okay? Yeah. Um, in which, um, because some of these things you don't, we can talk about it now because it went well, but most of these things you don't talk about until you've finished the okay. process so that was just an informal meeting and when you asked me that question um no it wasn't i didn't go there in a representative capacity of the yoruba people if that were the case we would have first referred to uh, our leaders uh um you know uh, Bab, uh, Bab, Bab Banjo and all the others and, and and got a mandate from there it was i didn't even know what i was going to i was just called for an important meeting the key for them was sunday Igbohu. it wasn't about the yorubas at that point it was sunday Igbohu needed to just give his word that if they manage to so solve this problem, can he guarantee that they will not attack their people? It was after that, uh, once he gave that guarantee, that negotiations started. And essentially the negotiations were between the federal government and the unions and the, and, and the northern unions and the people from the north and, you know, telling them to, to stop what they were doing and to lift the embargo. We did, however, and I, on my own personal capacity, also extracted a commitment from them uh, because we also have to get something in return. And what Sunday said and what I said was that, um, you know, in return for guaranteeing peace, the government has to make a firm commitment to clear the forests of the Southwest of these foreign, primarily foreign Fulani killers and terrorists who are terrorizing our people and who have been butchering our people. And uh, because their presence and the lack of political will by the federal government to get them out is really the source of this animosity uh, and resentment in the Southwest against the innocent House of Fulani people. So you needed to do that if you really wanted peace. And they yes. gave a commitment. And in, fairness, and in fairness to the president, a few days later, uh, he did order 
that these people should be flushed out and anybody carrying AK-47 should be should be shot at sight, if you remember that. I was all part of the fallout of these meetings and these discussions. However, the most important thing is this. I made the case at that meeting and at the wider week meeting in which you had about 100 people, because that was a bigger meeting, which was essentially a meeting of the unions and the government, but I happened to be there because I had played a role and they wanted me to say a few things there. But at that wider meeting, uh, the position was made very, very clear that that is what we wanted. I said it when I spoke in front of everybody. They said what they wanted and we all agreed and we had a successful conclusion to the whole thing. Um, uh, like I said earlier, uh, it, we, we managed to uh, save the situation. And that's the most important thing, that we don't have war. Our people are not being killed. There are no retaliatory killings in the South. We have relative peace, but we still have to solve the problem of the Fulani herdsmen and the terrorists in our forests in the Southwest. And indeed, not just the Southwest, but all over the country. There are mo more, more of these terrorists kill people in Zamfara and in Sokoto and in Katsina than even in the Southwest. So it's a national problem. But of course, we in the Southwest have risen to the occasion and uh, we've managed to indulge in what I call self-help. And I commend our people for that. I commend Ghani Adams, the OPC, for what they did a couple of days back. I commend Sunday Igbohu. I commend those that are in the field, policing our forests and assisting the authorities to ensure that um, those that kill our people are brought to justice. I also commend the Southwestern governors, Afeni Fere. I commend Babadi Banjo, Baba Fasunoti, and all our leaders, Yinkao Dumaki, um, every single one of them, including the great Magaji, uh, all of them, Akio Shutoku, so many of them, they've done ex exceptionally well. And then you have the younger men coming up, like Koiki. You know Koiki, I really love him, the young man, and so many others like that, that are now rising up and are doing so well. And without these people, we would have been overwhelmed. And, you know, it, it is because we have such strong men, such experienced men behind us, that is why some of us can speak with confidence uh, and with power, knowing that we are representing them and we will never let them down. Can I... Can I ask you a question? Uh, when the Nadanas asked please. for compensation, did you manage to get any compensation for the people of Yoruba land that was murdered in Shasha and their house was raised down very, in very, Shasha? It's a, very, it's a very good question. Now, I've been asked that, and I'll put it to you like this. And my answer to them, my, I made that point anyway, that we also have a right to have compensation. However, the problem is this. You organize your people, please. Organize yourself. Speak with one voice and everybody come together and try and bring the country to a standstill the way they did and then you make your demands rather than for all of us fighting one another criticizing one another come on Majero Alese you know you this one this one nobody's we need to come together as one in the southwest and say listen everything stop whatever you can do do it that is lawful that is Everybody come together and say, look, we, we will not allow any anybody to cross this line. We will not do this. We're speaking with one voice and we want compensation for our women that were raped, our people that were killed on the farms, property stolen, people slaughtered like cattle, like chicken every day in the Southwest, which is the source of my anger and the source of the anger of millions of Yoruba people today. We've got to come together, speak with one voice and make our demands collectively as one, like they did. Now, I assure you, if we can do that, definitely we're entitled to compensation. Not just We're not even just talking about compensation now. We're talking about defending us. The federal government has a duty and a right to protect us from these killers. And they have failed in that. So we've had to protect ourselves, which is where people like you all come in. And where's where Ghani Adams and co come in? Now, we will continue to do that if they don't protect and defend us. But if you really want peace in this country, definitely you have to compensate the people of the Southwest for what they have suffered over the last five years in the hands of the Fulani terrorists, who are not many Nigerian terrorists. They're not Nigerians mainly. I have to keep making that point because that's the truth. They're mainly foreign terrorists who are also killing outside Yoruba land. But for us, we also want compensation. But our leaders, our Feni Fere, our governors, everybody has to come together and make that demand of the federal government and force them to come to the table in the same way that the Northern Unions did on this episode and the people of the north did on this episode until we do that we're not going to get cobble from anybody and that's the tragedy of this we're not all moving in the same direction the governors have to work with the self-determination groups the governors and the afeni ferry have to work together we all have to support one another regardless of whatever your political beliefs are first build the bridge within ourselves everybody come together and then we can now stand together 
and say this is what we demand but the problem here the main problem here is you have some yoruba people will say well it really doesn't matter how many of your of your frigging people are killed in the forests all we're interested in is the presidency of nigeria so let the fulanis continue to kill the people of the southwest as long as we may get the presidency in 2023 20, through one of our own sons which i think is a reprehensible and abominable uh, position to take. First of all, you protect your people. You deliver your people. You demand for compensation for your people. You stand up for your people. You protect your people, regardless of whatever your ambition may be. If we could only come together as one, and we didn't have the Afojas in our in, 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 behind our lines, undermining us at every moment, criticizing us and saying, "No, we have no rights. We the, these people have the right to kill us." If we could come together as one, just like the North did on this occasion, and I saw it with my own eyes. Okay, if we could do that, believe me, not only will we get compensation, all this nonsense would stop. So we have to sort out our own backyard first. Once we do that, I assure you the sky is the limit and we'll get what we want. The Lekito gate was blockaged by our people and uh, the next thing they did was slaughter. Instead of calling a Southern Union and, and the presidency meeting. But instead of, when it happens at Niger no. Bridge, when they stop the truck coming down, this is what they did. But well, when we blockade no. the Kelekito gate, this it, is what it, they did to us. Listen, nobody has voiced uh, or spoken up when it wasn't fashionable to do so. I saw all this coming in 2015. I, FFA, and I said it. And everybody said I was an alarmist, I was a lone voice, and everybody insulted me at the time. But this is what I, I said everything that happened, I said would happen. And for the last five years, I have. I've, I've said it every day, every day. Look at what is happening. You spoke about the legacy. I spoke about that perhaps before anybody else. That was even a, a point that everybody was talking. What about all the other killings? What about the killings in Undo? What about the killings in Ibarapa? What about all over the Southwest? Our people being murdered morning, day, and night. Now, the point is this. You are absolutely right. There has been an unequal, unequal application of the laws to North and South. But what I want you to understand is this. I repeat. More people have been killed in the north by these Fulani, foreign Fulani terrorists, than even in the south. Zamfara, three to four hundred people a day at one point. Sokoto, two hundred people per day. But that is a problem for Zamfara and Sokoto. I happen to have an interest there because I'm a title holder in Zamfara. But if you come to the southwest, we are also being killed. And what this government has to do is to exercise the political will to eliminate and kill every single foreign Fulani terrorist that has come from Mali, Niger, Chad, or wherever hold it is they come from Mali well, who, to who come and kill our people. The first case? So, 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 well, who, I, that, that, who invited them? Well, the, the, you're asking me this question. I've been writing about the excesses of these people far, far before most people, in Euro, long before most people in Yoruba land have been, uh, did that. I, 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 listen, I've spoken about it. I've been persecuted for it. You know who invited them. You know how they came in. You know what their agenda is. But there's no point in going on about that now. What we have to do now is, as a people, we must come together. That is the people of the Southwest. And muster the resolve to say enough is enough. And then have the strength and courage to negotiate and discuss and join forces with moderates in the North, of which there are many, and say, listen, if we want to restructure, let us restructure together. If we want to go our separate ways as a country, you know, agree with us that we have that right and let's go separate ways to the country. If we want to unite Nigeria, let us restructure the country and stay together and be fair and equitable to everybody and not allow people to come and start killing our people. That is my gospel and that's my philosophy. We must act together as Yorubas. That's the first thing. I've spoken up for the Igbos. Nambi Tanu is my friend. And, you know, again, he has been persecuted viciously, yet he's the most popular man in the Southeast today, no matter what. He has got his act together and he's making his demands. In the, in the North, they have their own mechanism, very well organized and very effective, and they do not fear. They stand firm, even against Wari, on many occasions, they feel that what he's doing there, he hasn't done enough. In the, in the Middle Belt, the same thing. In the Southwest, we must come together. I am more of a Yoruba nationalist than probably anybody you know. I also believe in the right for self-determination. I've spoken to the Igbos have it. I've spoken to the people of Middle Belt have it. I've spoken to the people of the Corn North have it. And certainly the people of the Southwest have it as well. However, before you exercise that right, for goodness sake, we must have peace. And I'm also wise enough. Strong men do not like fighting. We are on the brink of war, my, my, my young brother. Believe me, I am in this country. And 
Everybody is arming up. Everybody is tooling up. And we must avoid that conflict no matter what. So I'll speak to anybody to ensure we don't have a war. But at the same time, I will insist that our people, the people of the Southwest, have the right to defend themselves, have a duty to defend themselves if any armed, armed um, aggression is forced upon us. And at the same time, we have a duty to try to ensure that we reach out in peace to people in the North, men of goodwill that also want peace, and work out our differences in a peaceful way. Where we got to today, it's not our fault. We know whose fault it is. But let's not talk about fault now. Let's talk about finding a way outside of even government to work together settle our differences and ensure we have law and order in our shores and in our country and in our zone that for me is the most important thing and that's what i've been working on and i believe that we will we will, we will achieve our objectives if we do that uh do you realize that some people from yewa are now refugee in republic of Benin because of these s-men and uh, lately they went I, to I, 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 lately they went to yes. uh a couple of days ago, OPC went and captured this man called Wakilu. It's the Kilu Wakilu, the one that's been uh, abetting the kidnappers in uh, in that area. They went to go and arrest him. They didn't kill him. They took him to the police station. And then some people in the area burned the house down, but they arrested this OPC. And then you've been doing something about this as well. You've spoken to some few people uh, on, on this issue. What have you been doing to get well, these people listen. free? First of all, first of all, let me commend the courage of the OPC and once again uh, Ibagani Adams, uh, the Ariana Kakamfo, for um, for the action of these very brave young men uh, who captured a brutal uh, butcher, a killer, a murderer, uh, a complete terrorist, a man that is not is, is not fit to live, as far as I'm concerned, who has terrorized our people for many years in the Ibarapa, Ibarapa area of Oyo State, a man that Sunday Boho would have captured long ago had it not been for the fact that he chose to be a little bit more restrained given the scrutiny that he was being subjected to. And he kept warning everybody that he was going to go after this man. Let me take, let me give you an example. When we had that peace meeting, the day we finished, and we had a big press conference, I got a call from him and he sent me pictures of 10 bodies. He said, he said, he said, Egbomi, this morning, they killed 10 of our Yoruba people. This was the work of Wakili. Look at it. And you're saying we should be restrained. And you're saying that, that we should just let the government do everything. Look at what he sent me. I was with Bello. I forwarded the pictures to Bello. There and then Bello, that's uh, Governor Yaya Bello. There and then Bello sent the pictures of these dead people to the IG of police and called him in my presence and said, something needs to be done about this. And the, the IG committed to, to discussing with the commissioner to do something about it. Now, now, that happened. So we were concerned long before then. The plight of the people of, um, of Remo and all these, I've been writing about it, shouting about it, speaking up for them, and, and speaking against those that have been subjecting this evil uh, on them, imposing this evil on them, and speaking about the inability or lack of political will of the government to do something about it. But on this particular occasion, it touched me because we had just finished the peace meeting, yet I now saw the hand of this. And I told the government, I said, this is what we are against. And this is why so many of our people feel so bad in the Southwest. And unfortunately, the resentment now spills over to the ordinary Hausa Fulani people who have done no wrong, but who just happen to be there. And people feel that, oh, it's all Hausa Fulanis and they're involved, which is not true. And that's the danger of this thing. Now, let me tell you what happened. When the, 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 pres, uh, the, the police didn't uh, effect uh, this arrest, but the OPC units, the OPC went in and effected the arrest. They didn't kill him. They handed him over to the authorities. And the minute they got him, I was, you know, Pictures were sent to me and I got calls. And I was very proud of this. And he was handed over to the police. Now, um, the, the person and the person that does most of the killing is not even Wakili. He's the godfather. It's his son called Abu. And Abu was not apprehended. So just this morning, um, Abu killed four more of our people. And he four of our people. I tweeted it. I wrote about it just this morning. And I've called on the government to either find Abu and arrest him and prosecute him or kill him or eliminate him and i have no apology for saying that uh, because he is a foreign fulani uh, uh terrorist who is killing the yoruba people at will he killed four just this morning so this is a problem we have to live with and i'm saying and, and of course i call for the release of the opc men uh, that gallantly arrested this this terrorist and handed him over to the police and i maintain that position and this is what we all have to do stand together and fight the evil not fight fulani house of fulani people but fight Hausa Fulani terrorists or Fulani terrorists, mainly foreign Fulani terrorists who come with AK-47 to our land, 
kill our people, tear, rape our women, and terrorize the community, and who have managed to have a very easy ride for the last few years because the government has not done enough about them. Well, the government has given a commitment that they will change their ways and they'll do far more. I see a few signs of that here and there, and that's where our salvation lies. If that does not happen, I assure you that we are going to be at war in this country just in a matter of years if things don't change, because you cannot continue to test the will of the Yoruba people. Let me tell you a little bit about the Yoruba. Let me tell you just, I'm sorry, let me tell you a little bit about okay, the Yoruba, which a lot of people don't understand. Let me tell you, in 1840, there was a man by the name of Oderin, Oderin, Oderin Lo. He was a uh, Balogu Oderin Lo from Ibadan. He was the only southerner in the history of Nigeria that stopped the Fulani at, at, in battle at Oshubu. And as the Fulanis were coming down, they're taking Ilori by then, if you remember. Uh, because of Afoja, they had taken Ilori, they had killed Afoja, they had an emir in Ilori, and they were coming down. But the, the, the real battle that stopped the, the, the downward advance of the Fulani was that in 1840 at Oshubu, and Oderilo and his soldiers, uh, outnumbered 10 to 1, defeated the Fulani in battle, pushed them all the way back to the gates of Ilori. They could have taken Ilori, that was his mistake, he could have taken Ilori back that day, but he went back at the gates of Ilori and came back into Yoruba land. That is the Yoruba for you, strong and resilient, slow to anger, but irresistible in battle. That is what we did at that time. Let me also tell you something else. During the civil war, the Nigerian civil war between 1967 and 1970, it was a third Marine commando under the leadership of the late General uh, Benjamin Adekunle, who at Ore, at the border of Yoruba land, where you enter Yoruba land from, uh, from Benin and from, yeah. from, from, from the Midwest, okay? It was at that point that the Biafran forces were stopped. If you remember, the Biafrans had swept through the Niger Delta, swept, 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 uh, swept through the Midwest, led incidentally by another gallant Yoruba warrior by the name of Banjo, Colonel Banjo. He was the one leading the Biafran forces. And he came all the way, swept everywhere, knocked everybody out of the way, killed all that stood in his path, and almost entered Yoruba land in Ore. But it was at Ore that the Yoruba forces gathered. Who were those Yoruba forces? Gallant men of the 3rd Marine Commando. 98% Yoruba fighting force. 98% of the soldiers of 3rd Marine Commando were Yorubas, led by a Yoruba man, Benjamin Adekule, and we stopped them. We stopped the Biafrans there. Yoruba commander to Yoruba commander. Yoruba troops to, against Igbo troops. But we stopped them there, and we now push them back, inch by inch, inch by inch, through the Midwest. We push them through the Niger Delta area. We push them back into Biafra land, and we push them back into Enugu. It was towards the end that Obasanjo was now brought in, and they relieved Benjamin Adekule of the command. Uh, Obasanjo now came in, I think about a year or so, before the end of six months or so, and then he now went into Enugu and took the surrender of the Igbos. The third Marine commander was the most effective fighting force in the Nigerian military, and it was a 98% Yoruba force. First Div, under General Shua, was also very strong. They came in from the north. Danjima was there and a number of others. But third Marine commander, a Yoruba fighting force, Yoruba warriors, Yoruba strong men, were the ones that won that war for Nigeria at the time. So nobody should test the will of the Yoruba people. You know, when we, we don't fight easily, for 100 years before the British came and colonized us, the Yoruba were fighting one another in civil wars. We are very warlike. That's why I'm always very reluctant to enter into a conflict with the Yoruba man, because it goes from generation to generation. But it takes us a long time to get to that point. That's mm -hmm. the truth. You look at it, that's the truth. But it takes us a long time to get to that point. Why? Because we're wise people. We know the damage that war can do. We know it's just not worth it unless you're absolutely certain. And we don't fight until we have the cutlass and the gun in our hand, unlike others. We wait. We're patient. We're clear thinking. We, are, we will avoid war. We will negotiate. We will talk. But if you refuse to listen to us and you push us into a war, you'll be worsted for it. And that is my greatest fear for Nigeria, that we they need to understand the nature of the Yoruba man. They need to know the kind of animal that, that is in us, that strong warlike spirit once we're provoked. If we're not provoked, we're the most gentle, accommodating, liberal people on this on this planet. Literally, we welcome everybody, whatever your faith is, whatever your beliefs are, whatever your ethnicity, we, don't, we do not uh, discriminate. But if you push us too long, for too far, and you slap us, and you spit in our face, and you insult us morning, day, and night, we will not stand down. One day we will rise up and we'll resist it. Now, our grouse can never be, because we're not barbarians, we're not animals. Our grouse can never be against another 
ethnic group. We do not kill innocent people in Yoruba land. Our grouse are against those that come, rape our women, kill our people, hide in our forests, and terrorize us. And I'm proud of what some of our governors have done. The Amoteku um, um, uh, 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 force that has been established, I'm proud of our Southwest governors for doing that. I'm proud of Governor Akere Dolu, particularly in the South, in, in Undo State, who had the courage to say, these people must leave our forest or they must register, even though others came and told him from outside our shore, outside our, our, the Southwest, that he was wrong. And we stood up to those people. When Sheh Ugaba spoke his nonsense, we stood up to him. When others said things about him, we stood up to them. And I'm proud of what they did. That is a Yoruba man for you. And it's across party lines. It doesn't matter whether you're APC, PDP, whether you're a nationalist, whether, whatever you are, you stand for your people first. Stand for your family. Stand for who is under you. Fight for them defend them protect them and you you make sure that even if it means death you do not back down however men of goodwill people that are moderate people that are decent and ready to talk to you and treat you like a human being and are ready to build bridges and build a consensus and have national cohesion you have you must cultivate the strength and the courage to talk to such people as well and build bridges and that's what i'm doing and i'll continue to do it wow fantastic i love i love all that thing you split out one good question for you, Thank sir. Thank you. Chief, do you think the peace accord you broke some few days ago, don't you think that peace accord is the main now as a result of uh, Abu killing people this morning and these people being held? The no, OPs have been held? No, no, have no, not, have no, not no, been no, no, because, because, the, the, because it's the terrorists that are doing the killing, not the ordinary Hausa Fulani person. We have never broken any form of peace and we will never, I will never, never negotiate or discuss anything with a terrorist. I believe anybody that, that 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 carries a gun to kill innocent people is a terrorist. And I would never even sit at a table with a murderer and a terrorist, especially those that have shed the blood of my people, indeed that have shed the blood of people anywhere in this country. It is wrong, and we're not talking about those people. There's no peace with those people. We can never have peace with those people. The people we 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 we, we had peace with, we established peace with, and we gave guarantees that they would not be targeted for assassination and murder are the ordinary peace-loving Hausa Fulani people of this country who live in our borders. And we as civilized people must protect them and must ensure that they are protected just as so we protect one another as long as they're in our land. And that is the right and proper thing to do. And we expect the same from the northerners who have in fairness to them, particularly in the core north, have not targeted southerners. So if we can just do that, at least we know we're keeping the innocents out of the conflicts. But when it comes to the terrorists, the murderers, the butchers, the mass murderers, the ethnic cleansers and the genocidal maniacs, there can be no quarter. It is left to the government to eliminate every single one of them. And if the government refuses to do so, or is unable to do so, then it's perfectly constitutional and lawful for us to defend ourselves. And that we will do without fear or favor. Even the Minister of Defense has, uh, has encouraged us not to be cowards and to stand up against these people when they come to kill us. Unlike before, when some in government said we should be praying as they're raping our women and they're, they're slaughtering us. That's no longer the case. It ain't going to happen anymore. You come to our home, you come to our land, you slaughter our people, and no policeman, no soldier will fight you. We will fight you ourselves. That I'm serving notice to every terrorist. We do not have, under the constitution of the law, we do not have, we don't have to, to you know, accommodate terrorists to come and mass murder our people, and we will never do it in the Southwest. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, in, in 2014, you said something at a conference to say, I think we should go our yeah. ways. Will you ever wear Yoruba Nation t-shirt like this? Will you ever wear one? It, it is the, it's the, what, what I said at that, then that was in Ibadan. Yes. Uh, and I meant every word I said. And what I said, and I said it then, I've always said it and I'll say it again today, mm -hmm. that if Nigeria is not restructured, then let there be no Nigeria anymore. We cannot be slaves in our father's land. We cannot be slaves in Nigeria. We cannot be second-class citizens in Nigeria. What we insist on is equity, justice, and fair play for every single Nigerian, regardless of your ethnicity or religious faith. If you're not going to accept that, if you don't have that, forget Nigeria. If you do not restructure this country and allow power to devolve to the regions, then forget Nigeria. That was my position in 2014. That's my, that's my position today. And I'm happy that even people in the north now are talking about restructuring. That's the only way forward. I've also identified with IPOB and people in the, I'm not a member of IPOB, but I've identified with IPOB. I've identified my good friend and brother, Namdi Kanu. And on various occasions, I suppose, the strongest speech I ever gave was, ironically, was in 20, 
uh, it was in 20, uh, I believe in 2018, at the beginning of 2018, in Enugu, at the, at the um, handshake across the Niger conference, where the Yoruba, Yoruba leaders, the Middle Belt leaders, and the Igbo leaders came together as one, and we had discussions. And I gave a speech on that occasion, very powerful speech, in which I spoke about the plight of the Igbo in Nigeria, and I spoke up for IPOP, I spoke up for Nambi Khan, and I said, he's my friend, he will always be my friend, and we disagree on many things, especially when he was attacking Yorubas, and I don't like the way he speaks about, about Northerners either, but sometimes, but the issue is that, you know, he has a position, and he's by far the most powerful man in the East today. I mean, you have some very good governors in the East, like Uguay, Umayi, and others, uh, but Namdi Kanu has the heart and soul of the young people of the East, just like Igbuha, Igbuha has the heart and soul of the young people of the Southwest, and so on and so forth. So you must understand that the, 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 the ethos and the feeling and the passion for, 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 for going our separate ways in Igbo land is very, very strong. It's very strong in the Southwest as well. It's very strong in various parts of the country. And if you don't, you can't resist that. If my people, the people of the Southwest of Nigeria, say that they want to go their separate way and there's a referendum and it's done peacefully, I would be the one to say, I stand by that and I'll support them any day, any time. However, we are still within a greater Nigeria now. We are one nation right now. We haven't got there yet. And as long as we're one nation, we must work in peace and harmony with those from the North and the East. And we must build bridges. We must have national cohesion and we must work closely together. And I see that happening on all sides. The Sultan of Sokoto has made some very positive contributions in the last few months. Honestly, I'm amazed by what he has said. For him to go as far as to say that seven to eight out of uh, the, the people that kill uh, the terrorists are actually Fulanis, mainly foreign Fulanis, for him to say that. And then for him to say that more people have been killed in the North than anywhere else. And then for him to say that not every Hausa Fulani person is a terrorist, although many of those terrorists are Hausa Fulani, that's very, he's admitted to something and he's also a victim. They are also victims of this. So as long as we're one nation, we have to be our brother's keeper. We have to work together. Let us not allow the terrorists, and this is the, this is the most important point I'll make today. Mm. Let us not allow the terrorists to push us into a civil war in which innocent people will now turn their guns on all sides against one another. I cannot possibly conceive me, FFK, being on the opposite side to somebody like uh, my good friend Shatima Yerima and Sharif and all the other gallants of the North. Very tough guys. Very tough guys. I'm telling you. I know them well. As strong and as tough as Namdi Kanu and as Sunday Igbuhu. But I cannot possibly conceive me, FFK, standing on the opposite side of a battlefield, aiming guns at them in a civil war. And if that ever happened, 50 million people would die in this country. And the whole West Africa subregion would be on fire for the next 50 years. May God never let it happen. But these terrorists are pushing us to a situation where it may happen if we don't get it right. Preach peace, preach unity, preach love, preach forgiveness. Come together regardless of whatever you believe and just try and keep the peace and act like human beings and be your brother's keeper. That's my gospel. That's my belief. And at the same time, you still negotiate for what you think is right for your people. And you still call on the government to do the right thing. That is to eliminate every terrorist, to kill them. Every terrorist that has come to slaughter our people. Mm. Thank you. Let me speak to the people in the house for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm having a chief FFK. I can call him Chief. I can call him FFK. He has given me the license to do that. I want you to take everything Chief is telling us or FFK is telling us with an open mind today. Because when you take things with open mind, you're going to learn a lot of things. If you don't take things with open mind, you're not going to learn anything. And you're not going to move anywhere uh, no matter what you do. Guys, I really appreciate your comment. I really appreciate what you're doing. Nobody has been paid. Money has not exchanged hand. No, everybody... The last statement FFK made was that he doesn't comprehend himself being on the other side of a war with somebody that he, he once called a friend. And this is some of the things that the Yoruba people have been saying to one another for a long time. We don't want war. But the way things stand now, I don't think it's, it's a matter of whether we want war or we don't want war. I think there is war here mm. already. And the reason I said there is war mm. here already is more than 10, 20 people are being killed every day for in the Gogon yeah. area, that the one we know about. Yeah. There's a friend of mine that was kidnapped this morning. Everything is going in pie shape. How long can we hold people back on this one for? I'm going to throw another question to, to FFK on this one. Chief, are we, is the civil war here already? Or do you think it's not here? Because a lot of people no, are committing we, we, the civil we, we, war. Is there already? 
we are in a state of chaos and havoc right now uh, in no, our what? country. People, are you, we're in a state of chaos and havoc. Havoc has been let loose in our country. Lawlessness, mass murder, ethnic cleansing, killing. Call them bandits, call them Fulani herdsmen, call them whatever you like. Um, all over the country, this is happening morning, day, and night. And the government is stretched, badly stretched. And Farage State, it is so bad. That and I believe there's a there's a there's a hidden hand in that, by the way. But it's so bad that at every moment children are being kidnapped for ransom, and and it's it's a terrible thing that's going on, and uh, so it's all over the country. So we are in a state of conflict. We're in a state of civil conflict, and I know that the government understands it has a problem. I have commitments from elements within the government who have said they are going to take it far more seriously. I see signs of that, in fairness to them, because the orders that, and directives that have been given by the president recently are very, very unlike before. And there is, uh, it appears, a greater cultivation of political will to do something about it. But we are in a state of conflict right now. And nobody speaks for the victims. Like you're doing today, you're doing a great job highlighting that. I've been doing that for so I was doing this when it was not fashionable. And everybody was abusing me and saying, why should I be talking about it? But nobody speaks for the victims, for the voices. But we're doing so, we'll continue to. So we are in a state of conflict. However, let me tell you what the difference, what, where there's a difference. We are not quite in a state of war yet. A state of war is a very different thing, completely different. State of war would then mean, for example, a God forbid it should ever happen, in the southwest 60 million yoruba people uh, we stand together and we oppose and we fight from house to house every single person that is against us and we get them out of our territory and our land and our cities are invaded by forces from outside and it will be a terrible conflict and we will also take the battle to the north take the battle to the east take the battle to anywhere where they seek to fight us, we take the battle back to them. And there you have a situation where innocence on all sides, just like Yaya Bello said, great man, great mind, and I think he has a great future, said that the victims, the Hausa Fulani victims in South, in, in, in Ibadan that were killed during the Shasha, Shasha um, killings were also killed by victims. That is the Yorubas that killed them, and incidentally they were killing on both ways. Both sides were victims because all of them were being killed by foreign Fulanis in the forests and being butchered by these terrorists. And then we start turning on one another. And that's what you have in a situation like this. Innocent people on both sides, simply because they, they, they have disagreements politically, pick up arms. Let me give you an example. If, for example, Namdi Kanu, and I'm not saying this should happen, I pray it never happens. I'm using it as an example, and I do not advocate it here, and I would never advocate it. I don't believe in armed struggle unless we are attacked. Now, if Namdi Kanu, for example, tomorrow got up, and, and put one million AK forty sevens in the hands of of IPOB, of IPOB people on the ground in the southeast. That would be the end of it. Right now, the government is 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 bombing bombing the forests of the southeast and killing innocent people. Is that not an act of provocation? I'm against that. But if they decided to stand up and say, "Okay, take a million AK forty and hit back," it would be chaos, and they would fight Nigeria to the bitter end. God forbid it should happen. If, for example, in the Southwest, one million AK-47 were put in the hands of the OPC and Yoruba nationalist groups, all of them together, in which there are millions in number, what is Nigeria going to do? It would be a terrible conflict. That's a war. And it would be against everybody that is non-Yoruba, particularly all the Northerners, which is something I cannot possibly comprehend and I pray will never happen. If in the North, all of a sudden, the, 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 the militant groups in the North came together armed themselves and started targeting every southerner, killing them from house to house, city to city, and butchering them. What would happen? It would be a terrible thing, God forbid. And then you go to the middle belt where everybody, where maybe Christians start killing Muslims. Can you imagine what would happen if we allow this sort of thing to happen in this country? It must never happen. We must continue to build these bridges and still have our differences and work them out. But war is not an option. If you have war, it will last for 50 years. And I'm telling you, I, I say this from the spiritual prism, from the spiritual life. I'm telling you this, and I'm hardly ever wrong when it comes to such things. It will last for at least 50 years. And the whole West African sub-region will be affected. It will be on fire. It will be a cauldron. Because you have Fulanis coming from all the other countries joining in the conflict. You have Yorubas coming from all the other countries like Kutonu, Togo, Ghana, coming to join on our side. You will have people from other parts coming to join you. It will be a terrible disaster for Africa. And therefore, it's left to us as leaders to sit down and work out our differences. And what are those differences? Ensure law and order, protect citizens from terrorists, fight terror, 
restructure the country, have purposeful, strong, virile leadership, and allow people to determine their own future. Have a referendum in the various regions, regions, it zones. If you want the Yorubans to stay in, treat them with love and with kindness. If you want the Igbos to stay in, treat them with love and kindness. If you want the Core North to stay in, treat them with love and kindness. If you want the Middle Belt to stay in this union, treat them with love and kindness. Love and kindness, equity and justice. That is what will save this country. If we can have that and we can restructure, then there's hope. Do you... I think I lost your voice, sir. Okay. It will break and it will be a very sad thing. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate that. Uh, one you. thing for sure, we believe, so many people believe that the war is here now. Has there been any arrests? Well, they, they, may, may, maybe, maybe they don't... <laughs> It's a very bad conflict right now, and people are being and injured. Should, we're being, and we're being subjected, subjected to mass murder, murder, ethnic, ethnic cleansing, cleansing all, all, over, the all over the country, and we're being, and we're being occupied, occupied the in the southwest by foreign, by foreign Fulani Fulani forces. forces. I agree, I agree with, that. with that. I, I agree, I agree with, that. with that. However, However the, war, the war has not come. War is a very different thing. Believe me, our cities will be a sea of rubble. There will be a sea, an ocean of blood. People will be slaughtered left, right, and center. It's a terrible thing. And it's a, and, and it would not just be in the Southwest, it would be all over the country. And everybody would run away. Children would be slaughtered. Mothers would be killed. Fathers would be killed on a daily basis. There would be no law and order. We'd be worse than Somalia. We'd be worse than Lebanon. We'd be worse than Iraq. We'd be worse than Yugoslavia. That is war. And I thank God we haven't quite got there yet. And if we ever get there, then you blame the leaders like me, like Chinumbu, like all of us. You blame us for that. Because if a war is a failing of leadership. We must not allow our people to ever get there. What we do is that we don't have peace at any cost. What we do is have peace on the basis of equity, justice, and decency. And you negotiate from a position of strength. You don't run from war. You don't get frightened by war. But you don't court war and you don't beg for war. Mm. That is my position. Conflict, yes. Terrible things, yes. But thank God the war, a real full-scale war has not started. And I pray it never starts. Mm. Mm. Okay. Do you think Tinumbu is a failed leader? I will not criticize Another no, I'm, I'm asking you to precise it. I just want a yes I, or no I, answer. I just, I, you know my views about, you know, well, let me put it to you like this. You know my views about Ashiwaju Bola Tinumbu. I've written extensively about him. Mm. Um, and I, I disagree with him. I disagree with the decisions he made. I disagree with the choice he made. I knew that he would never aspire, he would never achieve his ambitions. They're already squeezing his balls. They already got him in a corner. The likelihood is they may end up jailing him. They've taken his party from him. Everything that has happened to him. I said what happened because he doesn't appreciate the fact that you must negotiate from a position of strength and you must stand up for what is right and proper and you must stand up for your people. You do not go to Faso Roti's house, Baba Faso Roti's house, after his wife was murdered by Fulani terrorists. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, not his daughter, wife, God forbid. Daughter. His daughter was murdered by Fulani terrorists. And then people say, well, it's the Fulani's, the forest that did this. And you turn around and say, where are the cows? This is ins insensitive and it is wickedness. You don't do that. He did that. And that's why I think he made the mistake. And, and, and I don't blame him. I blame those behind him who continue to make him feel that all is well. Now, in, in terms of uh, as, you know personalities, I have nothing against him in terms of his person. But I disagree with him. And I think he's pushed us into a very dangerous corner and made us vulnerable as a people. And I blame him for a lot of the things that are happening to our people today. Outside of that, I would still love to work with him if it's about if it's about building bridges, coming together as one, as a Yoruba people, and standing against those that wish to eliminate us, subjugate us, terrorize us, and turn us into subhumans. If he's ready to do that, I want of these people to work with him. But I can never be a slave. I've never been a slave. I will never allow my children to be slaves, and I'll never work with anybody that that, that is comfortable with the label of slave, even if it's to achieve a greater objective of becoming president. President of what? President of a Nigeria where your people have been slaughtered? Hmm. 
Hmm. You want to be president well, over a sea of blood? Over a mountain of bones? You want to be president where your people have been sacrificed? No. Forget about that. The presidency is nothing. The important thing is to have decency and justice for your people and stand up as men of honor and courage, just like our leaders and elders of old, and say, listen, thus far and no further. Either you treat us well or we will not take it anymore and we will resist you. That is what a leader does. A leader leads his people. A leader doesn't try to sneak into power. He leads his people into a position of power and authority and wins respect for his people. I think Tinubu has failed to do that, and that is why I have differences with him. Okay. Are you saying that Tinubu, I'm just implying, I'm asking a question. I'm not actually saying it or putting words to your mouth. Uh, are you saying Tinubu is not a leader? I'm not saying... Um, okay, that, that's Bola, all I want to hear. I don't, I, I, let's let's not. leave it there, sir. I, that's I'm all saying I want that to hear. You, you know, it's all about everybody's a leader, even in his own house he's a leader. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter to me whether he's a leader of his house or a leader of his party or whatever it is. And I respect him for that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about his policies. I'm talking about his approach and his beliefs. I disagree with that. And that's all I disagree with. Outside of that, I have nothing but love and respect for him. And, okay. uh, and and I appreciate what he has done in the past. And I actually happen to like him as an individual. I just don't like where he has brought us as a people in the Southwest. And I think he needs to work closely with Afeni Ferre, listen to elders like Baba De Banjo. The wisdom of that man is remarkable. Baba by Fasurati and so many others. Listen to Are Onaka Kanfu. Listen to Sunday Go. Work with them. Don't undermine them. Don't treat them as if they're nothing. And stop thinking that money is everything. It is only God that can lift you up. It is not money. It is not newspapers. It is not uh, whatever else he has. It is not uh, all the money in the world. It is only God that can give you power. And it is only God that can keep you there. And I urge him strongly to face God and to realign and to work closely with his people, join hands with everybody in Yoruba land to protect the interests of the Yoruba and at the same time to reach out to his friends in the north and in the east to build bridges for nigeria that's what i'd love him to do but if he chooses to do otherwise that's his choice i don't hate him for it we can't all agree thank you very much for that yeah uh before i let you go sir there's one tactical question i'm going to ask you because i know i asked for an hour i've taken more than an hour i really appreciate your time sir goodness me and i will not take it for granted time last flies. question sir <laughs> are some yoruba leader too greedy Listen, I'm always center. very careful. Unlike, you know, I, I don't like to disparage my people uh, any, unless maybe it's private. I can I can criticize individuals, but to say some Europe, of course, human beings by nature, not just Yorubas, but every human being, you have greedy people across the board, north, south, east, and west, Nigeria, and outside of Nigeria. It's not an individual thing. What I think is that it's left to us to identify those that are selfless that are committed, that are courageous, that are strong, that are ready to fight our corner and protect our people, and then push them forward. Which is why I have so much respect for uh, Chief uh, Sunday Adeyemo. Yes, and I also have respect, of course, for Are, Ghani, and so many others, because I see them as strong, courageous men in Yoruba land. And this is extra political. It's not, you know, and, and by the way, we have excellent governors too. Matt yes. is a great man. Akiri Dolu is a great man. And we have people that are outside of power. Fayoshe is also my friend. We have courageous, great material in the Southwest. But I think the problem we have is us coming together. You don't talk to, Fayoshe doesn't talk to so-and-so because of whatever. So-and-so doesn't talk to Fayoshe or whatever. So-and-so doesn't talk to him or whatever. It's, it's ridiculous. We all have to, if Adika doesn't talk to so-and-so or whatever. No. Oh, because uh, his father was this, his uh, father was that, or he didn't. Uh, it's crazy. We need to stop this nonsense and come together as a people. We are under siege right now. We have been encircled by foreign Fulani terrorists that want to eliminate us all and take our land and rape our women. It's time for us to come together, set aside our differences, and stand as one, and then negotiate with the rest of the country from a position of strength. And that's what I believe. So, you know, everybody has a part to play. Everyone. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. You used to live in England. You are educated in England. Do you think the English system of government, do you think it will work in Nigeria or in Odudua land? I don't think it's... 
I don't, well, well, that's a completely different question. In, for Nigeria, I don't think the form of government is the issue. The, form of, the, the problem of Nigeria is a very fundamental one, which is one of, of servitude or the, or the, uh, by some, and the idea that others are supreme and born to rule, and the imposition of their will over other people. Uh, so it's a real structural problem, it's a fundamental issue, and it needs to be resolved. No matter what system you bring in, you're still going to have that problem. We need to renew our minds as a people, both northerners and southerners, and we have to agree that we're all the same, whether you're Muslim or Christian, we're all the same, whether you're from the north, the south, the east, or the west, and we have equal opportunities and we're equal before God. That is what we have to first fix before you talk about a system. But if you come to Yoruba and you're talking about Ududua, any system that you bring to the southwest will work. I, I, I personally prepare the parliamentary system, which the British um, uh, you know, have, 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 have put in place, which we used to have uh, up until um, not too long ago. I think it was 19, 1979, everything changed. And then we had the presidential system. But but it's not about systems. It's about justice and equity. And it's about fairness. And about everybody being made to feel together and one and that they have equal opportunities. If we can have that, the thing you put in place, believe me, you will have a prosperous country. You are a great country. And Ududua Republic will be a great country. If we have to go one day, we will go. It'll be a great country. It will be the first amongst equals we have in Nigeria and together and, and work together and make and make our country great. If it does, if we do, if we restructure, fine. If we don't restructure, then you know we're going to go our separate ways eventually. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, before they kill Abasha, before Abasha, whether he, he get killed or died, before they kill him or before he died, right, they know Nigeria was at the state of a brink of war. So even yes. if they fix it now, don't you think history will repeat itself? Because you cannot be trying to no. to patch a sinking ship. Well, let me. Let, let, you, you, it's a very it's a very good question. What you need, you make peace, you establish unity, you kill the terrorists, and then you now ensure you have good quality leadership that believes in equity and justice for everybody. Obasanjo did very very well when he was president. He was fair to everybody. And that's what enhanced national unity. If you remember, we came back from the brink. He took over from uh, Abdul Salami Abu Bakr. The country was in conflict then. But we pulled back from the brink because Obasanjo was fair to Northerners, Southerners, and everybody. If, I, if anything, he was very hard on his own Yoruba people. And uh, some of us, he, he, I mean, he ordered the killing of OPC, OPC warriors, which is something that I, was, I felt terrible about. Um, unfortunately, um, President Buhari has not cultivated the will to kill the Fulani terrorists, and that's where the problem lies. But Obasanjo did it when he was president. So it's all about leadership. If you get the right quality leader, we can still hold together, but that leader must be prepared to restructure, and he must restructure quickly. We need young, strong, virile, dynamic leadership in this country. And you have people that are aspiring for that position all over that country. You have people like Yaya Bello, you have so many others that are interested in running for the presidency. If you have people like that at the helm of affairs, there may be hope. But if you don't, if we continue the way we're going, and we have archaic ideas, and we have archaic people who, who do not um, do not understand the complex nature of, 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 of our union, then sadly we're going to end we're going to enter an era of conflict and possibly eventually war. I pray it never comes to that. Whichever way, whichever way, whichever way. Yes. If you don't have justice, if you don't have equity in Nigeria, Ududua shall come to pass. Amen. Believe me. Amen. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I will not do without reading somebody's comment before I go. Because uh, my impression is this person's comment. That's why I have to take pick on this person's comment. Adeletoye. FFK is an intelligent man. I must say God bless him only if it's truly with us and not against us, Odudua Nation now. Uh, before, when I heard that and that and that about him, I didn't know where he stands. But when I have concrete facts, 
about what he's been doing in the background, including videos and text messages about his action and his uh, his conversation with people at the top. I said to myself, no, 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 no. I think this man needs to be highlighted so that some people will know exactly what he's doing. And he said to me before we come on the interview to say, I'm not coming to your platform to praise myself. So I don't have to expose everything I've been doing. And uh, I think that is exactly what he's done. He didn't come here to expose everything that he's been doing. He just come here to make sure that there is no war because he managed to argue with that war is terrible, war is bad, and war is not something that anybody will want in any part of this world. Uh, before you go, sir, I know you might crucify me on this question, but I cannot do without asking you this one, the last one. If you like, you can answer it. If you like, you can dodge it. When was the last time you met Buari himself? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer if you don't want to answer it. I think I got my answer. Why would already. I want to answer it? You don't want to. No, but why? Okay. Why I'm... would I, President of the Federal Republic, no matter how much I criticize? I think we didn't get that properly, sir. You might want to take it again. The audio was playing up there. I said it's a, I mean, there's no reason on earth why I'd want to dodge that question. President Buhari is the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He's my president, even though I've criticized him probably more than anybody else over the last five years. He's my president. And, um, and the fact that he's a president, I have the right to meet him anytime that I choose. The fact of the matter, though, is that I have not laid my eyes on President Buhari since, I believe, 2015 during the presidential campaign when I was standing for President Goodluck Jonathan. We haven't met face to face since that time. And ironically, we live just across the road from each other. My house is directly opposite the villa. Um, and I went to the villa for the first time in five years, um, only about uh, a few Me days too. back when we had this uh, Me too. yeah, this peace negotiation thing. So, um, so that's the position. But he remains president whether I see him or not. And I have the utmost respect for his office. I disagree with many of the policies they put over in the last five years. I've said so openly, more than anyone else in this country. But I believe this is a time for us to now come together, even with those uh, in, the, in the government and in opposition, to build bridges to try to pull us back from the brink. And that's what we're all doing now. We're working together to save Nigeria. Okay, it provided Nigeria wants to be saved, because unless they try to yeah. stop this, and if, Nigeria, and if, if Nigeria, if Nigeria, if Nigeria, if 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 like I said before, Nigeria needs to want to be saved, and I believe I'm seeing a lot of will across party lines, across regional lines. I must tell you this: there is still hope, but if it comes to it, push comes to shove, there is no justice, there is no equity, there is no restructuring, and there's no political will from all the zones for us to work together and live together in peace. Then something else will happen and uh we'll take it from there thank you very much sir i'm going to let you go why i open the line the reason i want you to go why i open the line is thank i you. only asked for an hour and i've gotten more than an okay. hour from you i want to thank appreciate you very you. much yeah i will answer as thank many you. questions as i can on your behalf when you're gone if we still you. have time before your next interview you can watch the program you can continue watching the program and i hope next time when we invite so you people are waiting for me somewhere right I know, now I know, so i know, it's I know. Because I know. that's why i said i want to let you go because i had to an hour done well and i have more than an hour you got i will more. try and speak to you well tomorrow, i enjoyed sir. myself thank you i enjoyed much, myself thoroughly thank God you for having me it's a great honor to be here and i wish you well Thank All the best. Sir. God Thank be you. with you. Bye Thank, bye you. Thank, Thank you. Shalom. Thank you. Bye bye. Ladies